Welcome to Chef Marketing Academy. This lecture is one of my favorites. The title is How to Revitalize Mature Products. Actually, this lecture comes from my unhappiness with the framework that we had in marketing for more than a quarter of a century. And that was the framework that always talked about how we should take money out of cash cow products and invest into new ventures or new products, or what is roughly called the BCG matrix. In my analysis, I found that in the process, managers leave great products and great brands in a state of neglect and has a tremendous opportunity for revitalization. In fact, in the first restructuring in the 80s that took place in America, private equity people bought out large conglomerates and many of the mature products and brands were revitalized by them. So if an outsider can do it, then the view is that why managers don't do it themselves? And the answer is very simple. It's the career path of a manager. If a manager introduces a new product, it becomes mature, he or she wants to find an opportunity to do something else. And if you are in charge of a dog product, nobody thinks you have a career future in the company. So it's very interesting how personal career path almost plateaus the product or a brand. So this lecture is all about what companies have done in the past. Do we have some frameworks with which we can look at to revitalize mature products? I'll start with two examples. They're my favorite. Uh, one is nylon. Nylon was actually created as a fabric by DuPont just when silk became in shortage before World War II. For whatever reason, China was the dominant supplier of silk to Europeans and to Americans to make silk stockings for women. And somehow Chinese supply came to a halt. And therefore, there was this need to innovate to substitute what was a natural ingredient to a man-made ingredient, make it in the factory or the laboratory. And he did a fantastic job. Produced significant amount of nylon stockings with great luster, maybe even a little better than what Mother Nature could produce through silk. And then the World War II came along where nylon capacity was deployed to make military parachutes. In the meanwhile, DuPont went on and innovated next generation of technology, such as acetate and polyester, and everybody thought nylon is gone now. Nylon has no future. Well, nylon still continues to thrive. Once the war was over, you had to figure out new applications, and the new applications were primarily in furniture, furnishings, draperies. Then it went into wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. It went into artificial turf for sports. I've even seen an artificial ski slope even made from nylon. And today, nylon is still doing very well, primarily for stutures in the operations and surgery, as well as, in fact, making nylon parts for human body, what otherwise would be from metal parts. In other words, there is no end to the life of nylon it all requires managers' imagination or out of sheer necessity, one has to innovate about new applications, new users, new markets, whatever one can do to continue the journey about a product. I remember the same thing, my own research. When I was at Columbia University in the late 60s, we had forecasted the demise of coffee. Isn't that interesting? This was for General Foods, and the per capita consumption of coffee was nose diving. 
and young generation after the baby boomers especially, people who were born in the 60s began to start drinking soft drinks. And as they were eating out a lot more in fast food restaurants such as McDonald's, they could get the soft drinks and soft drinks took over the market from coffee and we all forecasted the demise of coffee. I could not be more wrong. Coffee was revitalized by Starbucks, not by the incumbents, but somebody who came from outside, saw the passion for coffee in Italian uh, coffee shops, I guess, or cafes, and duplicated that into a world-class enterprise and a world-class brand, and the coffee market got re-energized, revitalized. I can go on with more and more of these examples, but I would like to get into the framework. So the title of this presentation, as I mentioned, is How to Revitalize Mature Products. <clears throat> Why do we do it? We want to do it from a business perspective and a marketing perspective. The first main reason is the high failure of new products. In fact, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton has done tracking over, I don't know how many years, maybe three, four decades now, about the high rate of new product failures. It is estimated that as much as 60 to 65% of new products fail, despite market research, market testing, proper assessment with consumers, etc. And in fact, in one of my earlier lectures, I have mentioned that 65% of all marketing successes are by accident and very few are by plan. In fact, I even say that 30% of successes are despite management, that means despite the business plan. Stories like Mustang success is accidental. There are so many stories where you have accidental success. And the reason is that market is a very unpredictable phenomenon. While I can control and manage what I do internally, I cannot control the external environment and especially the customers and what the customers will patronize and what they will not patronize. I mean, the best examples of this one would be all of the television broadcast networks. They try so many programs and some succeed and have multi-year engagement. Other programs die with one season or less than a season. So this is the one main reason that there's a high failure of new product introductions. And the other problem with new product introductions is that it requires significant amount of uh, in initial capital investment marketing dollars, for example. The amount of marketing dollars you require is almost like $100 million to launch a national brand in consumer products. By the way, to launch a new operating software such as Windows NT or Apple's new iPad-oriented software, it's absolutely now into hundreds of millions of dollars. So the marketing costs of introducing new products and new brands are also significantly high. So you have a double jeopardy. Cost is high, failure is enormous. Second main reason is similarly, as we go toward more and more mature markets, the cost of innovating something new, different, is also very expensive. The R&D yield, research and development output, compared to input of dollar, is so minuscule. In fact, it is estimated by many research organizations that as much as 75% of, of all the amount of money we spend in research and development never commercializes. There may be a commercial potential, but usually it does not happen. And of course, in pharmaceutical products today, in order to create a major blockbuster drug, as they call it, billion plus dollar revenue, you now are investing almost a billion dollars in Inventing, discovering, as well as, in fact, in clinical trials to make sure that the efficacy and side effects of new drugs are properly approved by government authorities. Now, this is just introducing 
through clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, in the US market alone. For every blockbuster drug that we know, such as a Lipitor or Viagra, we have hundreds of failures on the other side. In fact, in the pharmaceutical industry, one of the main reasons why companies are buying each other out is that they're running out of patent rights. And more and more governments who are the primary funders of drugs in most countries are insisting on going toward generics. So given that the cost of R&D is also very high, failure rate is very high, cost of marketing the products are high. The next area is the other side. There's an enormous potential of mature products. <clears throat> as we talked about nylon, as we talked about coffee, and as people who are giving early uh, sort of predictions on uh, uh, death of windows, for example, uh, windows is gonna continue forever. It's interesting, here is a company, Microsoft, that's getting enormous amount of cash flow, billions of dollars through its Windows platform. And any improvement on the Windows platform seems to do better anytime they have tried to diversify into other gateways for devices, such as, for example, the cable uh, set-top box, such as mobile phones, such as, for example, in fact, uh, Xbox, they have had nothing but failures. On the other end, Windows upgrades, as well as Windows introducing new features, functions, such as the email platforms now, are doing exceedingly well. So mature products have a lot of life still left. And the last area is that whenever you are trying to grow an existing mature product, internal resistance generally is a lot less. In my research on innovation resistance, I found that not only market resistance is there for innovation, breakthrough innovations, but also surprisingly, there is a lot of industry and internal structural resistance. In other words, people don't like change unless it's mandated by somehow, let's say by policy, by regulation, such as unsafe products are taken out or seat belts are imposed or for example, uh, you know, the, the airbags that have come in. They're all mandatory. Voluntarily, market still loves the status quo. So do managers, so do companies, and most companies tend to coast in a status quo environment and therefore often get in trouble when the external environment has changed and they're unable or unwilling to change. So fundamental notion here is that it is in the self-interest of the company actually to make sure that they do revitalize mature products and mature brands to go along with it. The next slide talks about a typical product life cycle. While the original BCG matrix was more toward industry growth and market share, I find more appropriate measure is typically a financial outlook of the company through a given product. And there are only two measures on which companies are always evaluated by market analysts and by capital markets. One is growth, other one is profitability. I don't like profitability. I like instead the cash flow, which is a much broader concept than profitability in my view. And therefore I use growth and cash flow as my two axes and then come out with a typical two by two matrix. A startup product is always on the upper left in the chart. Fantastic growth, but you have to invest massively in that product, both in R&D as well as in commercialization, in supply chain, inventory management, and you don't see the cash flow. So they are basically called the question marks. And since the failure rate is very high, it is very likely that only one in five or one in 10 will ever become cash flow positive. The one that does become cash flow positive, you move to the right, and now we call that as a star, because that's the ideal model where the product is doing both high cash flow generation, it does not need any more investment, and it is still growing enormously. 
Then the product life cycle suggests that the product will mature and goes toward what people have labeled as cash cow. I don't like cash cow. I wish they would select cash horse, cash pig, I don't care. I come from India, cows are always sacred to me, okay? Now I did this as a joke at University of Arkansas many years ago, and I said cash pig or a cash hog or something, which is their mascot, and therefore they insisted that I wear a snoot, which is the snoot of the hog or a pig or whatever it is, for half a day as a punishment to make a joke about the whole thing. It was all in fun, as you know. But this we call it cash cow. And then ultimately through neglect, not because there is no franchise or patronage by customers, the product begins to age. Now there are some places where obviously there is a disruptive technology, which means the life of the product is no longer going to be as mainstream. We have seen this thing for film cameras versus digital cameras. But there's a fundamental rule in business generally that anything that was mainstream when we give it up, it always comes back as a major hobby business. Remember hunting? Hunting was a daily necessity in the hunter and the gatherer days. Remember gardening? Gardening is gone, but we do now gardening not for livelihood, but for as a hobby. Fishing. Baking breads, as we gave up baking bread at home and buy ready-made or branded baking loaves, I guess, we now have actually people engaged into baking as a hobby. Just goes on and on, right? Cooking. Have you seen the popularity of a cable channel called the Food Channel in America? It is true all over the world. We are making ordinary chefs extraordinary stars, just like movie stars. So any product that ultimately does not survive a technological change always has a market as a hobby or a specialty product or a specialty market. One can always revitalize that way. Otherwise, we allow them to become a dog product, aging product that means it has no cash flow coming from revenues and there is no growth at the same time. So products don't mature, is my view. Only managers do. As I mentioned, partly because it's the excitement of conquering a new peak in the mountain or it's the career pathing by and large. So next slide which is pretty much a reflection, but in financial terms. So if you plot over time against, for example, sales measured in dollars or uh, rupees or, you know, rin ben min or whatever is the currency, primarily what you will see is the line that shows you the rising line. It's a more sharply drawn than it should be necessary, but there's a typical S-shaped curve, but at the top, then it begins to decline back again and the average cost is coming down over time pretty much, and therefore you see a sliding line, which is the cost curve. There's a break-even point usually that happens during the growth phase where the cash inflow is more than the cash outflow. We are, don't have to invest anymore. Uh, the product itself is generating uh, enough cash flow to reinvest into it, but ultimately it begins to decline. It's just a same representation as we talked about from the previous slide, but with some numbers. So here are several strategies that one can discover, companies have discovered, I have put it together into a framework about how to revitalize mature products. Mature products can experience further growth by each one of the four key areas. Again, a simple two by two matrix existing products or existing markets and existing applications. So if where one concentrates into an existing market with existing application, it's point number one in the slide, lower left box, which I could just call it market entrenchment strategy. On the other hand, I can have a market expansion strategy by taking the same application, same use, markets are making, customers are making into newer markets. For example, international, emerging economies, whatever it turns out to be. That is point number two. 
Point number three is I stay with the same existing market that I'm serving, but find new users of the product. That's called new applications, application expansion. What I have to do is in other three boxes, expand the total market. And the last strategy obviously is where I have a new market with a new application and I call it market repositioning. So those are the four key strategies. And what we'll do is to go into each one of them in some depth and identify not all the strategies, but some key strategies that have made all the difference between a mature product plateauing or a mature product getting another life, getting reincarnation or whatever happens to the product. So let me show you the first one. The market entrenchment means gaining market share when the market is itself not growing, which means primarily it's a fight for market share. Right now, one would think about, for example, carbonated soft drinks in America. Given the aging of the population, the retirement of the baby boom generation that patronized the product maybe about 30, 40 years ago, today at an older age, are switching to non-carbonated beverages, such as fruit juices, such as fruit drinks, or energy drinks, or athletic drinks, whatever they are. So the traditional carbonated beverages, such as Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, RC-Cola, whatever the brands are, are not going to grow as much in North American market because it's a very mature aging population or wherever there is an aging population like in Japan and some parts of Europe. So in those markets, you have to fight for market share, which means you are growing faster than the market by and large. And how do you do it? So there are four key strategies that are recommended or companies have used it. Or the first one is multiple grades or multiple brands. For example, I can take something like a aluminum that Alcoa makes or Novellis or Hindalco, any one of the brands in the marketplace who are all industrial manufacturers of a metal. This will be true for steel to some extent. This will be definitely true for chemicals in my view. And all I have to do is to create differential grades. Some are so refined in a way and they're used for very unique purposes such as building aircrafts where I can command a much higher price for the same amount of weight. Or I can go for aluminum siding, a very commodity business, and therefore my margins or at least my value to weight ratio will not be in my favor. So I can, I can go for more and more value oriented by refining, having tolerances or weight oriented or basically uh, volume versus value is a key debate. And this is much more true in chemicals I have found. If you make a medical grade chemicals, let's say injectable through IV, you can come on extraordinary price for the same chemical than we would do as a bulk chemical. So specialty chemicals versus bulk chemicals clearly turns out to be the case. This was a strategy also used by Seiko. Partly as a watchmaker, the largest watchmaker actually, decided that they need to flank themselves and grow the market at two extremes from the mainstream market by coming out with a brand name at a lower level called Pulsar, then coming out with a brand name at a very high level called LaSalle, and they began to segment the market by distributing through different channels. So you can get Pulsar at mass merchandisers. Seiko will be primarily at department stores. And then LaSalle would be mostly through jewelry stores or watch specialty stores. And they were able to segment the market, reducing the channel conflict in the process and protect themselves. The same thing at Whirlpool, we did it. We were, I was the advisor at one time, and we found that while Whirlpool brand was fine, and they make the private label for Kenmore, which is a Sears brand, Whirlpool just dominates the appliance business against General Electric and against all other companies, essentially like um, Electrolux, for example. Whirlpool had to, at the same time, make an acquisition for a brand called KitchenAid 
for the premium market. Whirlpool, Whirlpool now even has bought a brand at a lower end, a price brand called Roper. And by having multiple brands, it has been able to preserve its market share, while their competition is actually declining in their market share. My next recommendation is retaining heavy users. We all know through data analysis that there's a 20-80 ratio. 20% 20 of your customers generate 80% of your revenue. And there's a technique that people have used in marketing called heavy half analysis. I love that technique. What it says is that since consumption is highly skewed, the 20-80 ratio, one should not use average as a measure to break the market, partition the market, but one should use the median as a way of breaking the market. So for example, and these data are just mind boggling, I think. I always still get impressed after 20, 30 years. You take the beer industry in US, and surprisingly, even today, more than 60% of the households do not consume any beer at all. Beer is a taboo. In fact, in Deep South, it goes against the religion, the Christian, Christianity. You can have a wine, but not beer. Interesting. So now you take 60% of the consumers out. 40% are consumers. 60% are non-consumers, non-users. And the 40% that you use, you divide at the median level of consumption, which ranges from one bottle a year to, let's say, 1,000 bottles. But the median may be 100. Half of them are consuming above 100. Half are consuming below 100 half that consume above 100, which is 20%, you call them as heavy half. Half that consume below the median, you call it a light half. We have three segments. And the message is very simple. There is no upper limit of consumption. Now, this is, of course, not a societally useful product, such as beer or cigarettes. But this is true of any wholesome product the same way. I find there is no upper limit of consumption. So I can even go further and take my heavy half 20% and find out who are the consumers. That's where I get the 20-80 ratio. And then I can profile who are the heavy users of the beer consumption. It turns out to be not the segment we think about, but it is something like, for example, blue-collar workers, young, and male. In America, women have not patronized beer, unlike in Denmark, for example. Very interesting. There is a gender bias, there is an age bias, and there's an occupation bias. So now the question is, can you make that consumer drink more? If it was water, we would be having societal blessing also. The same thing goes for water, or for milk, or for orange juice, makes no difference. Very interesting. I can now take that heavy half 20 and find its median, half of them will be 10%, call them as super heavy. The next 10% would be heavy, and then the 20% would be light, and then, the, of course, the 60% is non-users. And the top heavy, I've done that for long distance usage in America with this technique, for example. I've done the same thing for herbicides at Monsanto. It works. So I can now take this super heavy and then begin to analyze what is their per capita consumption. And that is where you get this aha and a surprise and a non-belief. For example, the real heavy consumers of beer in America consume more than 15 bottles, cans of beer per day. And we say it's impossible. True. But the way the data comes about is the following. They drink six packs on the way to work, home, I'm sorry, from work, at a tavern with their buddies. Then they, when they come home, they drink again. They're not into normal meals. They just want to snack, drink beer, and watch sports programs or movies. But they go on a weekend binge. Start early in the morning on Saturday go for fishing with their buddies, and they're constantly drinking beer till they come home.
Isn't it interesting? So average consumption in super heavy comes out to be that high generally. So I can go on doing similar analysis for other products. So that's retaining heavy users and concentrating into that segment and getting a higher share of that market than any other market. And this is exactly what Miller beer did at one time and became number two beer. It used to be the champagne of beer only for occasional users at one time. And therefore they went from there into heavy user market and revitalized the brand. The third market entrenchment strategy is multiple channels. In fact, many companies, once they organize around a given channel, let's say direct sales in a B2B environment, enterprise market, or going through distributors and not direct sales like 3M company has done, always get caught into channel conflict issues and therefore they are reluctant to bring about changes in the channel mix. They can do a product mix easier than channel mix, surprisingly. And this is where I find that companies that have the courage to say, I don't have to be loyal on any one channel. I need to feed volume for my product. I need to grow the volume or the value of the product by multiple channels just like Seiko Watch has done, Whirlpool has done, I think it can be done. The best example I can show you is uh, Dell computers that always went direct in the enterprise market. On the other hand, HP, which was still a smaller company in the PC business, HP of course was dominant in print, printer business, and they are primarily also the portable devices, you know, the test and measurement is their old business decided that in a PC business to become number one, they will open up all the channels. So you go direct to the enterprises, large corporations, but you go through dealers and distributors, such as, for example, all of the office supplies companies, or you go through companies like, you know, consumer electronics companies like Best Buy in America. You can do anything. So you become channel agnostic. And that's very difficult. But in the process, HP became number one. And Dale began to languish. Of course, there's a follow-on story that as uh, the desktop computers became more and more laptop, and now, of course, the netbooks and the tablets, they're becoming much more consumer-centric as opposed to business-centric. And in the process, the volumes are more in the consumer markets where neither HP nor a Dell are anywhere near consumer electronics companies will be, which are mostly the Koreans and the Japanese. So even multiple channels, you have to change toward where the market dynamics are, and whichever channel is appropriate, you need to align accordingly. I find the same thing about the online uh, market now. I remember old debates between uh, brick and mortar companies and online companies. I mean, the best example you can find around here, how you lose it by not participating in the channel evolution are the publishers, the bookstores, whether those are uh, Barnes & Noble or, in fact, uh, Borders, which just unfortunately declared Chapter 11 protection, bankruptcy, because online channels were coming along like Amazon, and Amazon can do a better job of fulfilling inform the customers better, do the analytics, etc. personalize, in fact, for you about which books you should reading, etc. all online, and the rest is history, that Amazon now has become a dominant distributor of online products in general. And this particular holiday season, uh, 2011, I can assure you that online purchases are going to grow much greater than uh, uh, store purchases by and large because people have no time, they are looking for convenience, and they know exactly the item you want. The more specialized you are and more the variety of inventory you have, the better if you are online because storing them, displaying them in the store is just too expensive a proposition. So stores primarily become 
exhibit centers or display centers for a few varieties, and then you encourage to say, by the way, if you want more specific variety or a special brand name, we distribute it, but you go on our online site, whether it's Tiffany's on the one hand, or Walmart on the other hand, or Macy's on the third hand, doesn't matter, any retailer. You have to create a blend between uh, uh, brick and mortar and online, and the blend would be very important for survival, if not for growth. So we are talking about growth here primarily. And this I've seen in industrial product quite a lot, especially heavy equipment where you have a direct sales force because you are customizing the product, a machinery that you install for packaging, for example. Even in those cases, a distributor channel becomes more and more necessary, as we will talk about later on, into another strategic bucket. And then the last one is that if these strategies are not sufficient, one can always think about making acquisitions and mergers. Acquisitions and mergers are inevitable for mature industries and products, especially during tough economic times. We went through that in the 80s under Reagan administration, and we allowed more mergers of peers with equal size ever imagined possible in America, almost ignoring our antitrust laws in the process. Recently, the same thing with the great economic recession of 2008. Now more and more companies are allowed to buy each other out. Pharmaceutical industry, we went through that round where Pfizer bought out some of the largest other pharmaceutical companies with government approval. And more recently, an Indian company called Aditya Birla Group has a division called Hindalco, which is a large aluminum manufacturer. They bought out Novelis, which is a private equity play of Alcon, which was a Canadian aluminum maker who collapsed, broken up into pieces, and in the process, Hindalco became a very large aluminum manufacturer. The same parent company, Aditya Birla Group, just bought a very large competitor on carbon black called Columbia Chemicals. So carbon black business now is consolidating on a global basis. Same thing is happening with respect to wireless companies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, like Motorola sells to somebody else. I think it's Google who has bought out Motorola, for example. So by and large, you can see ultimately in a uh, non-growing uh, market, a tough competition, economic downturn, consolidation is inevitable. As I saw in the 80s in the uh, beer industry, as I saw in the 80s also in the soft drinks industry, and just goes on and on, so, and, in, and so long as the government allows. So acquisitions and mergers are clearly uh, the mechanism. Often, in this case, many companies will go upstream to capture the margins and the profits involved in their raw materials. And today, in uh, food products, especially processed foods, or into what is called the manufacturing, grocery manufacturing of products, or CPG, there will be an effort to go upstreaming to capture the raw material costs, however you can do it. Because those are becoming a significantly large part of your total cost of doing business, just to survive. Same thing true about the uh, content distributors. We'll probably go more and more into content itself, uh, like the cable guys on the one hand, the telephone people on the other hand, who may actually say we need to own content because we pay enormous money for that content and our share of the total cost given to content providers is increasing to a level where it's not sustainable. I have seen this consolidation recently, of course, in the whole bailout of banks, massive mergers of large banks. So bank, in fact, First Union, which bought out Wachovia, which is bought out by Wells Fargo, and suddenly Wells Fargo becomes a very large national bank in America. Same thing, JP Morgan buys out Chase, they expand into more, and through acquisitions they became pretty big. So, and generally nowadays, as the industries become globalized, there is this evolution of the global rule of three. I saw this in the 80s, for example, in uh, the passenger tire industry, where uh, Goodyear is barely surviving, BF Goodrich is gone, 
They merged with Uni Royal, couldn't survive. Both of them were bought out by Michelin. Bridgestone, a very big player, couldn't survive. All the cost cutting didn't help. And eventually they were bought out by the Japanese tire maker called uh, Bridgestone, I think. So Bridgestone bought out, in fact, the, um, the, the, the American company, you know, pretty much. Very into Firestone, which is interesting. So that's the last strategy. So this is the first area to compete and to survive and grow a mature product. And that is market entrenchment. I will move to the next now area, which is, I call it market expansion. Market expansion requires developing new markets for the product and gaining a larger share of the new market that you are participating or you are creating actually. In other words, in your traditional market, your share may stagnate, but new market that is growing, you are creating that market and adding, in fact, your share as a dominant share. This is a brilliant strategy, of course, done by many of the fast food companies like McDonald's growing into emerging markets. Coca-Cola announced the same way that their future lies more and more with large emerging nations, especially China and India in this particular case, and they're massively investing and making sure that there they capture a dominant share while the share in America may be declining because of substitute products, which means non-carbonated beverages. In fact, uh, the late uh, chairman, uh, Robert Gozieta, used to often tell analysts that there is a future, very bright future, in the carbonated beverage business, just like the last century all came from North America primarily and some international markets, if he can convert Chinese to drink as much Coca-Cola as Mexicans do, let's say 100 bottles a year, from three bottles per capita per year consumption, he will have as much growth this century, 21st century, as Coca-Cola experienced in the last century. So there is no real sunset in that regard. And I think you can always revitalize a mature uh, product with a market expansion in this case. And I have similar examples about IBM, uh, about Cisco systems. They're all gunning for Asia market and especially emerging economies. Second strategy has to do with selling to intermediaries. I worked on this one many, many years ago in terms of uh, dishwashers. This was a General Electric who had come out with a very good dishwasher. Dishwasher was relatively new. It did not fit into the existing system because you had to have two uh, water tubes that goes into hot and cold water. Dishwasher takes so much of energy consumption, you had to have a 220 uh, wiring, which is not the normal wiring in America, for example. 220 voltage, 50 cycle, as opposed to 110 voltage, 60 cycle that we have. And it was just not compatible with an existing infrastructure. So General Electric came out with a very smart idea. New home construction was enormous in the 60s. Rather than sell to existing homes, they said we will sell to the builder of a new home where if you buy a GE dishwasher, we'll get a 50% reduction from the normal retail price. And by the way, if you buy all other GE appliances, such as a GE refrigerator, a GE stove, a GE hood, a garbage disposal, then you get even more discount as a package deal. Now here is what happens. Consumers who don't want to buy because it used to cost $600 in the 60s, which was a lot of money when the average household income was probably about $12,000 in America. $12,000, that low. It's interesting. You couldn't afford that kind of a thing. So it turns out in this particular case, by bundling into the mortgage as you buy a new home, or if you are a renter, then the landlord wants to have it to rent that faster. And they did all the experiments to show that a house in the same neighborhood, same price points, one with a dishwasher always sold ahead than one without the dishwasher by five, six weeks. That gives the builder enormous time to build one more house in America. Because in America, building is still mom and pop. A small contractor builds a few homes, that's the vast majority, 
and therefore he can have one more uh, in the summer season before the winter sets in to build a new house and then make money on that house. So it was a perfect thing to create value for an intermediary and ultimately end user was not as useful to appeal to because the end user could not use it, did not want to use it. In other words, it had bought the inability to use the dishwasher in the existing infrastructure, which is electricity and the water system, and also unwillingness to pay that kind of a price. I have seen the similar example, in fact, in industrial products where a company like Square D we sold large transformers to utilities and to enterprises, circuit breakers essentially, could not think about selling it through a distributor like Graybar, Granger, and ultimately those distributors were capturing more share because distributors as wholesalers work on very thin gross margins like 4%, 5%, etc. And they carry a lot of inventory and financing of the dealers and therefore, that middleman wholesale level was capturing more share in the market, so you align with them. Same thing, many of the PC makers have aligned with a very large IT product distribution company called Ingram Micro. Ingram Micro must be about $60, $70 billion revenue, and it is the largest customer of Microsoft and Intel. Uh, they sell more chips and software through Ingram Micro, who has probably 120, 30,000 value-added resellers and system integration people, mostly small to medium enterprises, and they all are actually installing things into offices or into factories. And that's a very large one million sales force and five million technicians, bigger than an army generally. So you use that channel also selling both directly and indirectly. So I would do be believe that selling to intermediaries and creating a value proposition for them and not the end user is a second major strategy. The third one to expand the market is mandatory use. In fact, probably this is my favorite strategy. Companies have never thought of making the product mandatory, especially if it is societally useful such as, for example, seat belts, such as, for example, airbags, such as, for example, smoke detectors. In fact, the story about smoke detectors is very interesting. They were not able to sell to the consumers. There was an inertia. Consumers didn't see the value. So they basically made it into a community compliance. A community mandated, fire departments would strongly recommend and enforce to say that you must have a smoke detector. Then you give the incentives by insurance companies on home insurance by saying that if you have the working smoke detectors, you get so much off and rest is history. Today, smoke detectors have become almost universal now in most homes in America, as it would be in other countries the same way. So smoke detectors is a great example. It is happening now with universal healthcare the healthcare reform which mandates every consumer has to have a healthcare plan. Doesn't matter who pays for it. And it's controversial, but it is going to be implemented pretty soon. Otherwise, unfortunately, if you take the state of California, in the automobile insurance, which is mandatory, but even then, 25% of the car drivers in California do not have an auto insurance. Health insurance will follow the same way. You make it mandatory, market grows. Of course, some people can't afford it, they may not buy it, but it's mandatory at the same time. Similar move is made now for telephony by having a public policy, which is all mandatory use, so that the telephone companies have to offer broadband as a basic service, a universal right, so that in rural markets, or into small towns near large cities where you have independent telephone companies who are offering primarily the cable, uh, they're offering the wireline telephone and maybe cellular services, but they are not able to go full broadband. Government says that we will make it mandatory and in the process create a demand. And I see the same thing, lots of occupations have certification. Without certification, you cannot be a lawyer. 
without certification, you cannot be a doctor. Without certification, you cannot be an accountant. And therefore, by certifying certain occupations, you can create a demand. So market expansion is another major strategy of mature products getting revitalized. And we talked about three of them, going international, selling to intermediaries, and mandatory usage. The third major strategy for revitalizing mature products is what I call applications expansion. Can you think the new innovative usage for the same product in the same market essentially? And there are a bunch and bunch of uh, case histories and company examples. So it requires usage segmentation, targeting special markets, and developing vertical markets, which is a value add things you do on your product for a specific vertical market. And I'll expand on all of them is the key strategy. Uh, new applications, clearly new usages. We talked about nylon in the beginning of the lecture. And now I can conclude with another great product. My favorite is baking soda. Baking soda has a natural decline because as soon as people go from agriculture to industrial age, they stop baking bread at home. They buy in the marketplace. So by definition, the consumer household market begins to decline with affluence. Also with affluence, people consume less carbohydrates and more protein, and therefore they eat more meat, for example, or chicken or whatever it is, and less bread. And given that you have a double shift with economic development of a nation, so you have to align definitely by selling it, let's say, to bakeries. But bakeries are industrial buyers. They will buy in bulk, and therefore you have to end up going into commodity pricing and therefore your margins may not be as good as you would have it in the consumer markets. So the baking soda uh, has done a fantastic job of identifying new users. And by the way, the reason I wanted to use this example is for something else also. In new product introductions, I find asking consumers what they want, what they dislike, makes no sense whatsoever. I'm very much in that regard the founder of uh, Apple, Steve Jobs, by saying that you put yourself in consumer shoes and make sure from a user viewpoint, make the product more friendly, more uh, non-technical, and things will work out. And therefore, all the three major successes that he came out recently, the iPod, the iPhone, and iPad, and before that one with Mac, he just made that so user-friendly. No consumer research was necessary. But just the reverse is true with mature products. In fact, mature products, consumers have already improvised and used the product for things that the engineer, the scientist would have never imagined possible. <clears throat> In America, we used to have a column. I think it still comes. And when I came as an immigrant here in 61, I was fascinated reading that column in the newspaper called Hints from Heloise. These were the days where you had full-time homemakers. Women were not working outside the family. And therefore, they were making innovative uses of household products. And this lady captured all that by having a column where people will write to her saying that, by the way, this is my new use. I'm making it. Out of all that knowledge, the baking soda company called Arm & Hammer discovered like 15 to 20 new users. And the reason is that the baking soda itself has versatility. It is not just for baking breads, but it is a great odor killer, as well as it is a very good cleanser. So suddenly people were using it for cat litter boxes to remove the smell of the cat uh, litter, essentially. They were putting in the refrigerator to absorb the odor in the refrigerator with prepared packaged foods that are open and sitting out there. And they've gone on like that, just discovering new use from consumers or users telling them what to do with the product. They came out with a laundry product for detergent, people who are allergic to chemicals. 
although it is a chemical, but they think like it's a natural product, people think. They did the same thing with toothpaste and almost, almost knocked the doors of the largest toothpaste maker called Colgate, and they almost surpassed Procter & Gamble, a brand of toothpaste in the process. So baking soda still is discovering new users as nylon is doing the same thing. So to me, identifying new users by actually observing or asking consumers what they do things differently with your mature product than what it was intended, you have a huge consumer insight you can get, mostly through clinical qualitative research or what we call focus group interviews type, that's very possible. So same thing is happening with smartphones. I must tell you that designers of smartphones never imagined the kinds of ways people will be using smartphones. Every technology has the same thing. And we have found the same thing today. Once we had the iPad or an iPhone, the number of application is mind boggling. I mean, today on my iPhone, I can do anything practically. Now, latest one in iPhone 4 and hopefully in the iPad 2 will be, or oh, not in iPad 2 because it's not voice oriented, but you have now a real personal assistant. It's called Siri as an application and you just mandate, talk to the uh, voicemail essentially and the Siri responds to you. And once you interact with that, you find it's just fascinating almost having your own personal assistant, living, breathing person with good manners all the time. No absenteeism, interestingly, right? So actually it replaces your personal assistant even better more reliable, 24-7, just goes on and on. Uh, my children who are in their 40s just love that application. So you find that smartphones will find users that were never imagined by the designers of the cell phones. In fact, cell phones itself is a great story. When I worked on that one in the early stages of commercialization, 1984, 85 is my memory, I found fascinating that all the consultants and experts that we had recruited say that there is a market for cell phones will be only about 950,000 by year 2000. Whereas in 2011, the total number of cell phone users now has crossed like 3 billion people. And they're adding 1 billion annually. A mind boggling change. So nobody imagined. So technology always is used by people in places and in manner that you could never imagine. So mature products can gain quite a lot by doing traditional market research. Uh, we did at Whirlpool uh, in terms of the technicians. When you call in Whirlpool called Cool Line, which is Hotline, but we don't want to call Hotline in appliances business. So you call it Cool Line. One million calls that come in, and we made that as our listening post or an innovation center essentially because it gives you insights about how consumers are using your refrigerator, your dishwasher, your range, whatever the appliance you have. Washing machine, of course, is the biggest product line that Whirlpool carries. Second major area for expansion is, uh, application expansion is new situations. The consumers or customers generally don't like to be bound by time and by location, mobility. In fact, cell phones have liberated all of us. So mobility platforms are becoming very key or what I would call portability in general. By the way, the company that really made money on coming out with portable test and measurements was HP against a dominant company which collapsed in the process. Tektronix used to have like 60, 65% market share, analog based. HP came out with a digital architecture, but made portable test and measurement for laboratories, for anything, and became a dominant player. And same thing, telephones, once they became portable, like mobile phones, like Motorola uh, handheld devices, the rest is history, again, the same thing. So laptops and tablets are the next, next evolution in the PC business. As personal computers, desktop, it probably would not have grown, but now I have my own dedicated one. And I have to have both of them probably, or whatever it is, but laptop becomes the dominant platform, right? So new situations, new time, new place, 
And then the last area for application expansion is vertical markets. And the largest vertical markets happening in uh, most countries is because of the cultural diversity, ethnic diversity is primarily, in fact, ethnic markets. Ethnic markets are no longer small peripheral markets, but they are becoming core. In my lecture earlier in the series, I did on changing demographics in America, and I had forecasted that by 2020, we, America will become a non-white majority. The biggest state, California, is already non-white majority. Texas, second biggest state, is about to become non-white majority. Third in population will be Florida, ahead of New York State, which used to be the dominant state in population all the way to World War II, essentially. But now Florida, it will be a non-white majority. So ethnic markets, whether those are African-American, Hispanic, which is a very fast-growing, very large market, or Asians and subgroups within them. Asians are not homogeneous. Hispanics are not homogeneous. So you can have even sub-segments, and those are the vertical markets that you can expand, whether you are in the cosmetics business, personal care, or whether you are in the beverage business. doesn't make any difference. Or entertainment business, such as uh, channels and the media and all this stuff. So, so the third major way of growing the mature products and revitalizing them is to identify unusual, new, different applications or usages. I will go to the next and the last strategy, which is repositioning. Repositioning means new market and a new use in that market, not the one that is currently used in your market. And this is very common. This is not as unusual as we think. The fundamental repositioning means that you are going into another usage and competing with different set of products. So Campbell's Soups is a great story. Soup is a traditional business. People always made soup at home. But when we became modern consumers buying branded products, you get the soup in a can. So you had the Heinz soup and Campbell's Soups, and Campbell dominated the market with a very fundamental positioning, which was the children. Hence the slogan, mmm, good, which appeals, taste appeals to children primarily. And they made an enormous money on that one as opposed to Heinz. Now, you don't have more children. Birth rate is go low. Children don't come home anymore to have lunch. Now, in fact, what you have is school lunches. So they have repositioned there for adults rather than children, and primarily for a meal for, let's say, dual income, no uh, kids' families, dinks, as we call them, because they would like to eat very light meal rather than heavy meal every day. They eat out otherwise quite a lot. So you can have a soup as a meal from luncheon to dinner. At dinner, the price point is more reasonable, and of course now, America is so obsessed with health. As we age, our health preservation, health obsession, and wellness is rising. And therefore, in the process, they're positioning how soup can be a more nutritional product than otherwise people have imagined. That is repositioning at, uh, in real time that we can talk about. I've seen the same thing with industrial chemicals. And this is a fascinating story. Actually, I sat on the board of this company. This is a pharmaceutical company. And they do clinical trial manufacturing small doses. It was a uh, consolidation of many companies. And they made out with an artificial menthol, which goes into chewing gums, like Wrigley's chewing gum, for example. And Wrigley's was their biggest customer, is my memory. But I traced as to from natural menthol, which is very expensive, how do you make it in the laboratory, in the factory? And I found out, actually, the menthol was <laughs> produced by, of all people, uh, the shaving blade people in, in UK. That was the blade company who had come out with a menthol so that you feel good when you shave your beard, essentially. So from one use altogether different, from one market to another one, that's repositioning. The next area, one that is very current right now, is everybody wants to go for solutions. So how do you go from a product company to a solution company? 
where your product is very core, but then it is adding a lot of peripherals and value add packages. So you offer a total solution to the customer in the marketplace. In a business to business market, this is very common nowadays. So companies like uh, General Electric, Siemens for example, uh, ABB, all in the energy business are thinking from selling products to selling solutions. And the solutions are very interesting in the sense that you are thinking about, well, what I would like to do is to do a life cycle costing of this particular uh, equipment that I'm selling you and show you that you will be actually saving money by buying the whole package as a solution by and large. Very interesting sort of things are happening and this is a very common thing. So system integration is one of the key platforms for solution and you don't have to make all the products. You become more like a independent consultant, let's say for a hospital to put together in fact their whole heating cooling system and all the stuff for example and you buy everything from others that you don't make but put it together. Remember the old Wi-Fi or Hi-Fi systems? Speakers will be made by somebody, amplifier by somebody else, tuner by somebody else, and you put together all of them. Oh, I remember in my days we used to have reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, which are gone pretty much. They're not even in museum, I think. You have the CDs then came along, and now of course you have everything on the internet by and large. And that reminds me, another major solution-based platform emerging is cloud computing or application software by and large, which gives you more solution-oriented approach than the traditional approach we have done in the IT business. So product to solution is a second strategy in terms of repositioning. Or the third one is generic to specialty, which means, as I mentioned earlier, when a product is displaced by another technology which is more affordable and better, then the older technology always gets revitalized as specialty market, hobby market. So here is bottled water. And in the late 70s, early, Perrier, which is a French company, came out with a brilliant idea of repositioning it as an adult cocktail drink, especially when there were enormous anti-alcohol campaigns and a lot of penalties. Drinking and driving was just not tolerated in the society, especially in continental Europe. And now in the US the same way. So given that, they came out with Perrier as a non-alcoholic beverage, but suitable at the cocktail hour, where adults gathered together and did very, very well with that positioning, pretty much. And there are many other brands that have followed the same suit. And the same thing, as I mentioned earlier, that you go for specialty chemicals, specialty aluminum, specialty steel, anything in industrial raw material, make it specialty. And then you can command much greater price points. The volume won't be that great, but value will be very high. So let me summarize this pretty much. Conclusion is the following. My view is that mature products Products don't mature, managers give up too soon on their products and their markets. You can always therefore revitalize your markets and products. Managing the life cycle of products with financial objectives, which is growth and cash flow that we talked about is very key, no matter at any stage in the life cycle. While launching a new product is exciting, and that's what people do. Have you seen the launch of new products? Everybody gets excited, distribution is excited, ad agency is excited, product manager is excited, you know? I mean, this, this, this is sort of the excitement of marketing. But actually, the real value created for corporations is to manage mature products and revitalize them. Those are the unsung heroes in companies. And this has happened at 3M company, which otherwise prides on innovation. But if you look at the kinds of things they've done with post-it notes, which is a mature product now, kinds of things they've done with the scotch tape even, mature product. Actually, more growth has come from their mature products despite management mandate by the leadership. And they're doing fantastically well as a company. And this is true of every large corporation that I have analyzed 
and therefore this message that don't give up on mature products. I don't buy the argument that today's breadwinners are not the same as tomorrow's breadwinners or yesterday's breadwinners. I don't like that argument at all. My view is that if you found a good breadwinner, keep the breadwinner and you can always get more out of that. It's like a golden goose, don't kill it. Thank you very much.